everyone. My name is Elizabeth. I'm the treasurer and secretary of the Conservation Education and Outreach Working Group. And I am pleased to present our first panelist of our Faces of Outreach webinar series, Ms. Tori Bird. She is the Conservation Action Coordinator at Utah's Hoggle Zoo. Hoggle Zoo. Hoggle or Hoggle? Hoggle. Hogle Zoo. She started working with the zoo roughly eight years ago while she was pursuing her bachelor's degree in ecology in organismally biology. Organismal. Or, organismal. I'm going to be asking about that later. Um, at the University of Utah. For five years, she helped to manage behavioral enrichment and training logs for all of the animals at the zoo as a volunteer. In her final years of university, a conservation biology field trip went to the zoo for a presentation from their community science wildlife biologist to learn about the boreal toad conservation program. This led her to an internship with the program in the summer of 2018. At the end of her internship, she applied for and was accepted into her current position. For the past three years, she has loved working with and growing zoo and community focused conservation projects. In her free time, she enjoys board games and outdoor exploration. She recently took up rock climbing and is looking forward to getting out for some beautiful climbing locations across Utah this summer. Um, we are recording this session and we will be sending out the recording to our registrants as well as posting on our website uh, along with our schedule for our upcoming webinars uh, for this series. Um, we will post that link later on. So it is my pleasure to introduce Tori. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you everyone who's here today and to the Wildlife Society Conservation uh, Working Group. I am so excited to be here and brag about conservation and education outreach at Hogo Zoo. Um, if you were at my brief intro last month, I spoke about how fortunate we are to have a physical campus that's open to the public 363 days a year with some very unique attractions to get people through our gates. Um, because of this, sometimes outreach is really simple. It's walking out of your office and having a conversation with a guest at their favorite or sometimes more interesting least favorite animal exhibit. But outreach and conservation education work goes so far beyond that at Hogel Zoo. It involves citizen science, uh, environmental engagement, education through camps and classes, uh, elements of environmental justice, and uh, outreach through partnerships and web platforms. We are so fortunate to have a large and diverse staff that is able to do conservation and education outreach in so many different ways through their work here at the zoo. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about the importance of zoos in urban environments. Many zoos have a footprint large enough that they have the opportunity to create outdoor space for both people and local wildlife to enjoy. Green spaces have been shown to improve quality of life in urbanized areas, and they're associated with better air quality, cooler temperatures, and reduced noise pollution. They really do have a big impact on our lives. They provide people with important opportunities for recreation, relaxation, stress reduction, and exercise while offering communities a safe outdoor space for social interaction. I think this was really highlighted in the last two years of the global pandemic, while people were seeking safe and enjoyable activities, which often led them outside. The benefits of, zoo, of green spaces within zoos and urban environments doesn't stop at humans. Um, through thoughtful ground maintenance, we provide wildlife corridors and pollinator habitat. Trees offer shelter for invertebrates, small mammals, and birds in urban areas. Uh, paired with fewer motorized vehicles and quiet hours after dark and little light pollution, uh, zoos and other green spaces uh, become refuges for urban wildlife. Both of these photos here were taken on our zoo grounds. Looking over the zoo, it is almost completely hidden by our canopy cover. And on the right hand side, we have a bobcat uh, visiting our bobcat Loki uh, caught on one of our wildlife cameras on grounds. Hobo in particular, uh, is connected to our urban, our urban wildlife interface through Immigration Creek, which runs directly through our zoo grounds, and we protect as a buffer as we know it acts as a wildlife corridor. Linking to these green spaces, we can provide the opportunity for people to connect to the land. In 2009, the number of people living in urban environments 
surpassed those living in rural environments for the first time. And this disparity will just continue to grow. In an increasingly urbanized world, it is vital that cities offer an opportunity for their inhabitants to somehow stay connected to nature. It is thought that experiences gained in your early years can shape how you view your own role in, your, in the natural world. And family-friendly recreational opportunities, such as visiting your local zoo, can provide young people with the opportunity to connect to nature. And it's not just through on-site interpretation, but through small and formal things like the smell of the hay barn or having a place to watch mature, mature trees change with the seasons. It allows people within city limits to subconsciously connect to nature and hopefully inspire personal conservation at home. And of course, people come to the zoo to see our animals and connect with them. Without zoos, the majority of people in urban landscapes would not have the chance to see a polar bear take a dive or experience the strong grasp of a giraffe tongue. They wouldn't lock eyes with a leopard or see a baby zebra run. And they may not ever have the chance or opportunity to learn about the unique threats that each of these species faces and along with many others. Connections made with animals when you see them in person run so much deeper than seeing them in print or on film. A strong predictor of how humans make decisions is empathy. Zoos, aquariums, museums, and gardens allow humans to connect with animals and plants, not just the local, common, the urban, but the exotic, the unimaginably huge, and the heartbreakingly endangered. Finally, on-ground education opportunities, such as summer camps, school trips, classes for both children and adults, paired with clever programming by our education team, allow for both formal and informal learning in brief interactions and succinct, accessible interpretation. Some papers released in 2020 suggested conversations about animals on zoo grounds and shared experiences between guests foster a sense of group identity, which in turn has been shown to motivate pro-environmental behaviors. Much more on our incredible education team later. It is also important for us to look farther than our zoo grounds and into our community. The Salt Lake Valley is both geographically and culturally unique. Surrounded by the Wasatch Mountains, seven streams run through seven canyons into the valley and into the Jordan River, eventually ending up in Great Salt Lake. We are one of the very few places where our rivers do not meet up with other rivers and flow into the ocean. We are a closed basin. Recreation has long been part of the culture of Utah, with millions of people visiting and moving in each year to enjoy our five national parks, world-class skiing, and ample mountain biking and hiking and climbing opportunities. In fact, the Wasatch Front is one of the fastest growing regions in our nation, and the population is expected to nearly double between 2010 and 2050. For the most part, this recreation has been concentrated outside of the Salt Lake Valley and can feel surprisingly inaccessible to the people living here. And as more people move into our cities, we are concerned that our populace will become increasingly disconnected from the incredible nature that surrounds them. When people are disconnected from nature and in their own backyards, it is so much more difficult for them to feel connected and to care about struggling wildlife abroad. Bridging this gap between community members and the environment and conservation is one of the main goals of outreach at Utah's Hobo Zoo. One of the main tools that we use to bridge this gap is community science projects. So what is community science? Essentially, it is a research collaboration between scientists and volunteers, which expands opportunities for scientific data collection while providing access to scientific information to community members. And why is it important? There are so many benefits to community science, both for the researchers and the volunteers. It allows for focused efforts over long periods of time. While many projects have relied on students or seasonal technicians, the integration of volunteers into a project can oftentimes help to keep a project going even after those students or technicians terms end. This allows projects to continue with little interruption. It also allows for a larger pool of data to be collected, as it is not limited by staffing availability, and you can have multiple teams of volunteers running concurrently. Unsurprisingly, this is very cost effective. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that research funding is very hard to come by, and it has to pay for a lot of things. By integrating community scientists into a project, those funds can be 
directed towards tools, equipment, and data analysis instead of staff time in the field. Community involvement also increases transparency. So much of science can feel inaccessible to those not directly involved with it. Through the need to communicate and recruit volunteers, community science encourages researchers to find effective ways to communicate their work and gives the community an opportunity to ask questions and be directly involved. This makes science much more accessible to the community at large. And finally, with the kind of community science that we do at the zoo, it creates meaningful connections to our local wildlife and landscapes. Through facilitated trips, we are able to take people out of the city and into the regions of the state that they may otherwise not have the opportunity to visit. We encourage exploration of our incredible wild lands and facilitate opportunities for folks to get up close and personal with some of our local wildlife. I'm going to tell you about some of the community science projects that the zoo works on over the past several years, and backgrounds of the projects, questions they're trying to answer, and how our community scientists are involved. But before I do, I want to encourage you all to look for community science opportunities where you are. Perhaps your local zoo or university has a project that needs your help. I'm going to be talking about wildlife community science projects, but it can span everything from transcribing old documents to literally mapping galaxies. And a lot of this work can be done from your home on your computer. And a great you know, uh, resource for this is this website on the screen, zooniverse.org. Uh, I very much encourage you to check that out. Anything that you are interested in or have expertise in is probably up there. So the first community science project I wanted to start with is actually the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or AZA's first community science project, Frogwatch USA. It was started in 1998. Um, and it's focused on amphibians across the United States. Amphibians are a really important uh, species on the landscape as they can act as a sort of canary in the coal mine. Because of the permeability of their skin, they're very sensitive to changes in their habitats and pollution. So when you see a decline in amphibian species, it can often be an indicator of more things to come. They're also important predators and prey on their environment and offer excellent pest control. For the past several decades, the world has been experiencing an amphibian extinction crisis due to a variety of factors, including habitat uh, destruction and fragmentation, climate change, and infection from a fungal pathogen called Bacteropithecium dendrobotitis, or chytrid for short. If you're not familiar with this fungus, uh, it infects the skin of the amphibians, which inhibits their ability to respirate and osmoregulate and eventually result in death through cardiac arrest. Frogwatch USA operates out of local AZA chapters, um, and the program teaches community scientists to identify their local amphibians by their breeding calls. We ask volunteers to go out to a site about twice a week during the breeding season at dusk and listen for about five to 10 minutes and record everything that they hear. This helps to describe local species diversity, detect rare or invasive species, suggest shifts in species diversity, range, and phenology over time, and can help to inform the development of land man management strategies. This project really paved the way for community science at AZA accredited zoos. Next is winter raptor surveys in partnership with Hawkwatch International. Hawkwatch International aims to conserve the environment through long-term monitoring and research on raptors as indicators of ecosystem health. Conducting winter raptor surveys allows researchers to monitor the health of critical habitat locations raptors rely on each year, helping to define resource and conservation priorities. Often studied during the breeding season and migration, winter raptors are often an afterthought. However, a majority of raptor mortality occurs during the winter months. Our winter raptor surveys aim to fill these knowledge gaps and allow us to gain a better understanding of factors contributing to overwintering mortality. These winter surveys focus on finding high density areas of species diversity uh, that will identify potential mortality risks such as shooting and poisoning and mitigation opportunities. The data is also being used to educate landowners to help them manage the land in a way that is friendly to raptors while minimizing benefits to ravens. Hawkwatch International formalized these survey methods in 2011 and has since grown our survey hotspots and volunteer base. 
now they have a decade of data that they are analyzing. And we really look forward to seeing how our community science work will inform management and decisions with, to help wintering raptors. Caterpillars Count is the zoo's newest community science opportunity. It is run out of University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and looks to track how caterpillars and other arthropods are responding to changes in the environment. Insects and arthropods play many important roles in their ecosystems, including being the main source of food for many bird species. Caterpillars in particular are really important to migratory birds, which depend on them for su successfully rearing their offspring. But climate change is shifting the timing of many phenological events, such as spring leaf out, correlated insect activity, and bird migration. What we really need to know about this is if they're shifting to the same degree. Caterpillars Count seeks to answer this question by examining insect activity across a large geographical area. So far, most of the observations in this project have been made on the East Coast of the United States, but sites have spread to now cover the United States and even into Canada. This summer, we will be launching our survey efforts with our guests and team volunteers. Six days a week, a short program will be put on in one of our amphitheaters describing the background of the project and then inviting our guests to join our volunteers in a survey where they will visit designated tree sites with uh, what is called a beat sheet, which they'll put under a branch to catch any arthropods that fall off when that branch is shaken or beaten. So they will then use a handy guide to identify the arthropods down to order. We are so excited to be able to offer this opportunity for our guests to participate in meaningful citizen science work while they are on zoo grounds during their visit. We hope that it will pique their interest in this project and community science and conservation as a whole, make them more likely to participate in other projects in the future. This is a really great project that can be run out of anywhere. And if you're interested in getting involved, I highly recommend you look it up and look to register a site for yourself or your organization to monitor. Next, we have Pollinator Pursuit, which was created as a partnership between Hogel Zoo, a local environmental uh, nonprofit called Sageland Collaborative, Utah State University Extension, and Utah DNR, and uh, the Wild Bee Project. Its mission is to improve conservation efforts for Utah's sensitive, poll sensitive pollinator species by leveraging the power of community science. Species of particular interest in this project are monarch butterflies and bumblebees. Monarchs have seen a 99% population decline since the 1980s, and identifying and preserving their habitat along their 30,000 mile migration route will be essential in preserving this iconic species. And Utah is home to more than 900 species of bees, which serve vital roles in agriculture and our environment. In fact, the southern half of our state actually has about the same bee density as the entire eastern half of the United States. Most of these are solitary bee species and have evolved to forage on a limited range of native flowering plants. One bee species of particular note is the western bumblebee, which was once the most common species of bumblebee in western North America, but has now fallen in reported sightings by more than 40% in the last decade. Loss of this and other declining pollinator populations could result in damages to the world's economy as well as the ecosystems that they live in. Currently, the specific areas that Utah monarchs are using for breeding is unknown, and when it comes to the bumblebee, scientists are essentially at ground zero for understanding which species use Utah habitats and to what degree. Community scientists help fill these gaps in a number of ways, varying in investment, starting with out and about surveys. These are incidental surveys in which volunteers simply report sightings of pollinators in their day-to-day -day life. If volunteers would like to be more engaged with this project, they can choose to become a site steward, which involves adopting a site and visiting it two to three times during the field season and reporting what they see. All of the information gathered from both types of surveys helps agencies, organizations, and others plan effective strategies for conservation. It helps ensure that conservation funding is directed to the right places in Utah so that protection will be given to the species and habitats most valuable to the monarch, bumble the monarch and the bumblebee. Without these data, decision makers would essentially be making conservation decisions on their best guesses. 
The City Nature Challenge is one of my favorite examples of the power of community science. It utilizes a community science platform called iNaturalist for participants to collect observations of wildlife in their cities. It started in 2016 by the California Academy of Science and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles as a friendly competition between LA and San Francisco. Since then, it has grown into an international event. For four days at the end of April and beginning of May, participants are encouraged to get into their natural environment, the natural world around them, and document anything and everything they see. It is a shining example of what can be accomplished when we work together towards a common goal and also a fun competition to see which cities can gather the most observations, find the most species, and engage the most people. After the four-day observation period, there is also a period of species identification. This is a great opportunity for those that might not have been able to get out into the observation period, but still want to help to use their knowledge uh, to help to ID these species. In 2021, the City Nature Challenge had 52,000 participants from 419 cities in 44 countries make over a million observations of 45,000 species, including at least 2,100 rare, endangered, or threatened species. These observations on iNaturalist are available to anyone and can be a great data pool for researchers to pull from. It has helped to track species movement, identify previously unknown habitats for species, and document new species behavior. If there is a species you're interested in, I highly recommend you look it up on iNaturalist and see what observations have been logged. If your city participates in the challenge, any observations you make during the challenge period, which is April 29th to May 2nd this year, will be automatically included in your team's observations. This year, the zoo is really excited to partner with some of the other AVA accredited institutions in our valley and other environmental organizations to host some bio blitzes to get observations both around the zoo and at our local river. iNaturalist is a really powerful tool and observations can be logged anytime, not just during the challenge. This brings me to the community science program that is most near and dear to my heart, the one I got to do my internship with, our Boreal Toad Conservation Project. Boreal toads are a high elevation species of toad, a subspecies of the western toad that occur in the mountainous regions of the western United States. Their populations have been seeing really steep declines in the last approximately decade. This is due to the same variety of reasons that we mentioned earlier with Frogwatch USA. But Boreal toads are unique in a few ways, including that they don't have air sacs. So they don't make breeding calls like other amphibians. They do make a sound when they're stressed, but it's kind of like a meeping sound. It sounds vaguely like baby geese and is not an effective way to survey them. So since we can't do auditory surveys, we have to do visual surveys for these toads. The zoo has been involved in these surveys for about a decade, and we partner with Denver Zoo, Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo, Loveland Living Planet Aquarium, Utah Division of Natural Resources, and the U.S. Forest Service on this project. Each summer, our Utah Con Conservation Program supervisor takes community scientists into the high mountains all around our state to look for the toads. We are able to sur survey in currently known habitat, historical habitat, and possible new habitat. This help from the zoo and community scientists uh, frees up the state DNR biologists to work with other important species in our region. Our toad trips range from a day in the canyons in the valley surrounding our valley to multi-day trips in the far reaches of our state. Community scientists are also able to check out a toad bucket from the zoo and go on their own self-directed surveys. This was particularly popular over the last two years of the global pandemic. One of my most favorite parts of this project is seeing people get so excited about a species that they oftentimes didn't even know existed a few hours before, especially a species that is not the large charismatic megafauna that people often think about when they think about the zoo. I also wanted to briefly mention the other prong of this conservation project because it's also incredibly important. Each of our partner institutions houses an assurance colony of toads that were collected as egg strands on the Ponscunt Plateau just outside of Bryce Canyon National Park. The toads on the Ponscunt Plateau seem to have some resistance to the chytrid fungus, which is why that population was chosen for individuals in our assurance colony. 
And for years, <laughs> each institution has been trying to breed these toads. And we tried everything. We hibernate them to induce breeding behavior. We played rain sounds and other amphibian calls to try to set the mood and nothing. <laughs> Until in 2018, Denver Zoo tried a hormone treatment on their toads and it worked. That year, they were able to release thousands of these teeny tiny baby toadlets that you can see in this right hand picture back onto the Ponce Gump Plateau into their natural environment. Since then, each of the other partner institutions has applied this hormone treatment protocol and has all had successful breeding. Last year, Hobo Zoo was able to release our first lot of toads back into the Ponce Gump Plateau. These partnerships and multi-pronged approaches are proving to be vital to conservation and restoration work. And I think they really show the true power and opportunities that zoos present for conservation. Now we're gonna take a deeper dive into one of my main projects here at the zoo. Community conservation and restoration work of our local urban river, the Jordan River. So why the Jordan River? <laughs> there were several factors that we considered that made working along the Jordan River a good fit for Hobo Zoo. The first was it lo its location. As I mentioned earlier, we have Immigration Creek running directly through our zoo as a tangible connection for our guests to this watershed. Next was guest familiarity. A survey conducted at the zoo several years ago showed us that about 65% of zoo guests lived within 10 miles of the Jordan River or crossed it on their daily commute. This meant that they are already familiar with the zoo or with the river and the challenges it faces. Then the importance to our community. Our most recent master plan identified the Jordan River as an area of importance to our community as an urban wildlife interface, gathering spot, and recreation location. Community connection to conservation. The river presents an opportunity to connect guests with local conservation work. Utah's Hobo Zoo works on conservation projects all around the world, from Churchill, Manitoba to Madagascar. But we also recognize just how important it is to work on conservation in our community. This not only allows us to make positive changes in our community, but also gives our community members tangible connections to conservation. While it can be challenging for people to understand why they should care about the conservation of a tortoise in Madagascar, it's much easier for them to connect to that if they can see the positive benefits of conservation in their local areas. Need, the Jordan River has been a vital resource for as long as people have been in our valley. Some of the residents have been better stewards than others. <laughs> in our state's history, the river has been redirected countless times, resulting in an unnatural river that faces challenges of bank destabilization and habitat loss. It's also a vital part of our watershed with the seven creeks from all seven canyons surrounding flowing into it. Unfortunately, that means that any trash that gets into any of those creeks ends up in the Jordan River and eventually in the Great Salt Lake wetlands. The one trash boom along the river uh, collects between two and three tons of trash every three months, and 65 to 75% of that is just plastic bottles. And as we stated earlier, we're a closed basin. So all of that trash stays right here with us in our valley. Our final consideration in choosing to work along the Jordan River was environmental justice. For those of you unfamiliar with the Salt Lake, with Salt Lake City, the Jordan River flows just west of the city through a number of low income and ethnically diverse neighborhoods. In contrast, our zoo, sits on the east side of the, city, uh, of the city on geographically higher ground in a more affluent and predominantly white area of Salt Lake County. And we know that people are most likely to visit green spaces close to their home, yet the availability of quality green spaces varies considerably through urban areas. Historically, the Jordan River has not been considered a safe area for families to visit due to problems with illegal dumping, mounting garbage, overgrown areas and declining water quality. Working with our partners in restoring the Jordan River enhances access to green spaces in minority areas. Working along the river allows us to bring the zoo to other parts of the city, particularly to our west side and promote more opportunities to Salt Lake City residents. Finally, it has been well documented that increased human presence in an area decreases crime. So getting more people to the river in turn makes it a safer place for all community members. So now that we knew where we wanted to work, 
we had several things to consider in developing a conservation and restoration program along the river. First, it needed to be educational. It was important to us that when volunteers take an action, that it not just be an action without context, but that while they were doing it, they were learning about the river, the challenges it faces, and what they can do to help. Next was partnerships. This is a 52 mile river that runs through 17 municipalities. So it was abundantly clear from the beginning that we were going to have to get some great partners to work effectively. We were able to form a really, really wonderful partnership with the Join River Commission, which is one of the few organizations that works along the entire length of the river. This partnership allowed us to utilize their knowledge and their connections in our work along the river. The work also really needed to be impactful in identifying projects and ways to encourage guests with, to get to the river. Particular focus is given to those projects that can have long term benefits. Things like pollinator plantings are a great example of this, as they can provide long term habitat and food resources. To make these projects successful, we offer, uh, also look to ensure long term upkeep and buy in from property owners and community stakeholders. Our projects absolutely had to be inclusive. The zoo prides itself on being a place that is inclusive to all people from all backgrounds and all ability levels. It is important to us that this extends beyond our gates and into any work we do in our community. We strive to create diverse opportunities that are accessible to all ages and abilities. Next was research. As we just spoke at length about community science, it's been a part of the zoo's work for many years, and we were eager to involve our Jordan River work in that. That said, in looking at community science opportunities, it was important that we not just be collecting data for data's sake, but that it be going towards meaningful scientific research. This led us to look into what projects were currently going along on the river that we could contribute to. And finally, community relevance. The Jordan River has been used for irrigation, drinking water, transportation of goods, and waste disposal since the early 1800s. It is a staple feature within the valley and has ties with residents in many ways, from simply crossing it on their commute to being an area to bicycle, walk their dog, fish, and otherwise recreate. But through years of misuse followed by disuse, Salt, many Salt Lake residents have a negative perception of it. Addressing and changing this perception is a critical aspect of restoration and protection. We wanted programs that highlighted the river for what it is, a wildlife corridor teeming with animals like fox and mule deer and birds of prey, an area that can be joy enjoyed on foot by bicycle or boat and a safe place to be. Our work along the river aims to weave this river back into the communities through which it runs. One of the things that this led us to was wildlife cameras. In 2019, we were able to form a partnership with a well-established wildlife camera community science project in our area called Wasatch Wildlife Watch, which is collecting data on how wildlife uses our urban and landscapes. We now have between 20 and 25 cameras along 22 miles of river at any one time. Wasatch Wildlife Watch and so our Jordan River cameras are also able to contribute data to other projects, such as the Urban Wildlife Information Network through which we have been able to contribute some of our data to a number of scientific papers, including some interesting ones looking at the effects of COVID on green spaces. And Snapshot USA, a national project that aims to facilitate the collaboration of cooperators to contribute to a national database of public wildlife data to examine nationwide trends in mammal community assembly rules associated with natural environments and anthropogenic filters. We are very excited to be able to continue this project and continue to contribute to this meaningful research. Camera Traps also presented a diversity of volunteer engagement opportunities. When the project was initially designed in late 2019, we planned to be able to take volunteers out with us uh, to do the camera maintenance, to change batteries and take SD cards, and even to have volunteers adopt cameras and maintain them for extended periods of time. Unfortunately, with the project launching in spring of 2020, that has not been something that we've been able to do yet, but we are very eager to start that soon. However, the project did present other opportunities for volunteer engagement to continue throughout COVID. With each camera able to capture over 10,000 photos in just a few weeks, 
we have hundreds of thousands of photos that need to be sorted through with the blank photos removed. And then we also need to identify the animals captured. Volunteers were able to come to the zoo or have a USB stick with photos mailed to them uh, to sort these photos. This was particularly popular for those volunteers that were unable to come to the zoo for so many reasons during the peaks of the pandemic. By including the community in this data sorting process, they are learning about the wildlife around them, and we hope to pique their interest in stewardship of this natural area. To date, the larger Wasatch Wildlife Project has engaged more than 5,400 community scientists. One of the most common things we've heard when we talk to these volunteers is some version of, I had no idea we had fox, muskrats, beavers. I'll have to keep an eye out next time I'm at the river. Through this, we're able to utilize the zoo as a vehicle to connect our larger community to the river and bring Salt Lake forward as a part of the conversation about urban wildlife and riparian areas. Now I thought it might be nice to take a bit of a break from me talking and all this information dense stuff and look at some of the really cool photos that we've captured on our cameras. Every camera gets boxes. You get some fun interspecies interactions like this fox and striped skunk. We get information on breeding. We have de behaviors such as feeding as demonstrated by this raccoon eating a snake. We get some great selfies and not just mammals, we also get quite a few birds, like this beautiful pheasant, this owl. We even got a fish once. We also get domestic animals like this cat demonstrating just how damaging they can be to populations of birds and small mammals. We have a coyote we see regularly. We get ecosystem engineers like beavers and muskrats. Some very impressive survivalists like this three-legged deer. And some really incredible surprises. That was one of my favorite series of photos to come through. So the cameras are just one aspect of our work along the river. We also host volunteer events aimed at river restoration and conservation. This started in 2018 with three staff events as we recognized that any successful project needs our staff's buy-in. From there, we were able to expand out into community events. In the summer of 2019, we had the art exhibit washed ashore on zoo grounds. This exhibit is made by artist Angela Hazeltine Posey, and it is larger than life sea creatures all made out of plastics collected over just 20 miles of river in Oregon. It's a beautiful exhibit and a really powerful message about the effects of plastic in our environment. But we found that as a closed basin, when we talked to our guests about the plastic pollution crisis, they said some sort of version of, well, I'm glad it's not happening here. It's an ocean problem. They were missing the fact that as a closed basin, all of our plastic stays right here in our environment. So that summer, all of our volunteer events along the river focused on trash cleanup and removal, both in the river, from Canute and along the banks. Since then, we've integrated so many more types of volunteer events. Uh, invasive species such as scotch thistle, uh, phragmites, and puncture vine, also known as goat's heads, are big problems along the Jordan River. So much so that re residents have reported not using the river uh, because of risk of injury to themselves, their pets, or equipment like popped bike tires. Scotch thistle and puncture vine removal have been really popular with our volunteers as it's something that they can do where they see the immediate benefit in changing the environment. It's also very much appreciated by our partners as this type of manual removal is just not something that they can keep up on on their own. The planting of native trees has also been incredibly popular, popular and these trees help to stabilize our banks as well as provide food and shelter for birds. We've also done understory plantings aiming to uh, increase the habitat diversity and provide forage and uh, shelter for small mammals and insects. Being the beehive state, we are excited to work on creating pollinator gardens along the river, especially so with the US Fish and Wildlife Service announcement last year that the listing of the monarch butterfly on the endangered species list was determined to be warranted but precluded. Monarch safe 
is one of the newest programs in the Association of Zoos and Aquariums Saving Animals from Extinction, SAFE, program. Hobo Zoo has been really proud to be able to be involved in the planning and execution of this program. We planted our first monarch way station in 2020, a second in 2021, and have planted two additional pollinator gardens along the river. This year, we aim to install at least two more of these pollinator gardens. And I am just so incredibly proud of the work we've been able to achieve through this program. Over the last three years, we've hosted 27 volunteer events along the length of the river. We've had 337 participants, many that come over and over, which is just so cool to see. They have put in over a thousand cumulative hours of work on the river. They've removed 368 pounds of puncture vine. We've planted all those monarch way stations and pollinator gardens, and we have filled three dumpsters full of trash moved, removed from the river and from along the river. Also planted hundreds of trees. We are so excited to continue to grow and expand our work along the river. This year, through a grant uh, from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums funded by Disney Conservation Fund, we've been able to partner with our city and county library systems to make nature kits available for checkout. We recognize libraries as another trusted community resource and are so eager to continue to build partnerships with these library systems to better serve our community where they are. Our kits include a backpack with binoculars, a butterfly net, bug viewer, a clip-on camera lens for macro photography, and species ID cards. While the kits were made with the Jordan River in mind, they can be used anywhere. Users are encouraged to take photos of wildlife and plants and upload them to iNaturalist and continue to build a robust data set for local flora and fauna. We're so excited to be able to develop this partnership and encourage nature play and exploration. We have also been fortunate to receive funding and develop partnerships with other community partners that have enabled us to distribute conservation focused items to our community. This was so valuable over the last two years when the zoo went through a period of closure and then a moratorium on in-person events. Through these giveaways, we have distributed hundreds of red bud and blue spruce trees to our community. We were able to mail out milkweed seeds and growing instructions to over 300 households and classrooms. And we mailed out cleanup um, supplies to enable community members to get out along the river and clean up on their own. Another program that I have been so fortunate to be a part of is our Diversity and Field Conservation Scholarship Program. According to Data USA, 69% of conservation scientists and foresters are male, and 94% are white. It's pretty easy to see how that is not representative of our population. Staff at Hobel Zoo recognized this and saw an opportunity to address it through our internship program. Conservation and zoo careers can be incredibly hard to break into without an internship. And most internships at Hobel Zoo and other zoos have historically been full-time and unpaid, which makes them completely inaccessible to those community members who are unable to take a break from paid work while also incurring living expenses. In 2019, we were able to secure funding from a family fund foundation uh, for our diversity and field conservation scholar program. The scholarship provides funds during the internship term and is available for members of historically underrepresented groups, including women, individuals who are non-binary, and all genders who are of an ethnic minority. Past conservation scholars have said that without the scholarship, they would not have been able to accept this internship opportunity and that it opened doors to their future careers. They have gone on to diverse master's programs from zoo and aquarium and animal shelter management to city planning. They have secured jobs with watershed restoration and the US Forest Service to name just a few. To date, we have had 11 scholars go through our program and we are looking to onboard four, four more for the summer of 2022. Now, I'm excited to share with you our Wild Aware Utah program. As the human wildlife interface expands through housing and other developments throughout Utah, rural areas are becoming increasingly urbanized. And with outdoor recreation becoming increasingly popular, there's a rise in citizens concerned about how to be safe in these areas. As Utah continues to grow, and as human and wildlife compete for spaces, the number of conflicts will increase. 
So Wild Aware Utah Partnership is a non-advocacy conservation program working through collaborative efforts to provide education to minimize conflict between people and wildlife. It aims to create awareness throughout Utah that will foster new attitudes towards wildlife and motivate behavior change in people, resulting in minimizing conflicts with Utah wildlife. Utah's Hogo Zoo, Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and Utah State University Extension have partnered to develop tools to create to educate individuals and communities about how to live, work, and recreate safely with wildlife. Wild Aware Utah provides simple guidance and direction for Utah communities through these three main messages. First, be aware of the wild. Learn about Utah wildlife. Second, share the wild. Respect the wildlife and change your behaviors accordingly. Three, care for the wild. Take action, coexist safely, and help to keep wildlife wild. The Wild Aware Utah program does not take positions on wildlife issues or policies. The materials are designed to be fact-based, neutral, and applicable throughout Utah. Each of the partners has full-time staff whose job descriptions include part of their time being dedicated to Wild Aware Utah. This has been incredibly helpful with continuing to move the partnership towards its goals without taking up too much time and resources from any one institution. It has also allowed for us to capitalize on the many different skills and talents from each of the partner organizations. I truly think that this partnership collaboration and spreading out of responsibilities is what has made Wild Aware Utah a success. And we know that it's been a success in a variety of ways, including that we've been contacted by conservation workers in surrounding states interested in implementing a similar program in their states. One of the goals of the partnership is to provide science-based wildlife safety and awareness materials. So we were fortunate to secure funding several years ago to write and print informational materials. This included cards detailing good camping practices shown in the top right here, brochures on general wild, Utah wildlife and specific species, and door hangers that could be distributed into areas that have had wildlife sightings or where a conflict has occurred. These have been made available to ranger stations, campsites, animal control departments, and any other interested party. With so many things shifting to digital now, we are currently exploring ways to contribute, continue to distribute this important information without using the paper to print. We have also designed and made trail sign resources to be used in recreational areas. This is shown in the left hand side here. We've made a general sign, sign template with the main messages that apply to any species in any area. This sign can be downloaded from our website with the option of adding additional logos and information. Speaking of the website, we maintain wildawareutah.org as a catch-all site for wildlife safety in Utah. This includes information about individual species, uh, resources for safe hiking and camping, pet protection, and what to do regarding aggressive wildlife, wildlife carcasses, and injured or orphaned wildlife. The website got a big upgrade in 2020 with a complete redesign. Going along with this, we have also been working on updating and streamlining the information on the site. This resulted in two awards from the Association of Conservation Information in 2021. First place for graphics and logo, and second place for web design. So big shout outs to Aubrey Pernod and Bradley York from the DNR for their work on those projects. One of the things that the zoo has been able to provide to this partnership is our incredible education team. They run Wild Aware Utah programming for kindergartners and fourth grade students. Um, we targeted this age group, hoping that if they learn these things early in life, they will grow up with them, distribute them to their family and friends. These programs were put on hold in 2020, but I hope that we'll be able to pick them up soon. We're also fortunate that we are able to passively promote this messaging to our guests here on Zoo Grounds, where we house a number of local species and integrate Wild Aware Utah messaging wherever we can. For example, we have grizzlies here, not black bears like we have in Utah, but we use their exhibit as a chance to promote the messaging of safe camping practices. We also have a portion of our zoo that is entirely uh, animals that have been removed from the wild due to injury or human interactions. This includes vultures that were the victims of vehicle strikes. Uh, we have a bobcat that was removed from the wild by a well-meaning human and a raven that was kept as a pet. 
by having a sort of passive messaging, we are able to ensure that wild orangutan messaging is getting out into our community without much involvement from our staff. We also host Wild Aware Utah Day at the zoo. It's typically in July during the peak outdoor recreation season. And for this event, all of the partners come to zoo grounds and they teach lessons about uh, safe camping, how to identify the stats and tracks of our local wildlife. And we have fun themed enrichment and keeper chats from our incredible keeper team. Finally, on to our incredible education department. One of our most important education programs is called IC. It stands for Informal Science Education Enhancement and is a group of 11 science organizations that get funding from the Utah State Legislature to go to all public and charter schools in the state of Utah. Uh, the minimum is to offer science programming to every, every school on a three-year rotation. Some go every year, but we are currently on a two-year rotation. All funds from the legislator from the legislature and must be matched to the, from the organization. So schools get a two for one on taxpayer dollars. Our IC team currently has eight full time staff in our education department. And their curriculum uh, is based on the second grade core curriculum. It teaches about habitat and adaptation using bio facts, soil samples, plant samples, pictures, and live animals. Designed for individual classrooms, this hands-on program is about 60 minutes in person and 45 minutes when done on Zoom. It also provide, requires that we provide free teacher professional development, and we have a full one full-time staff member who does these programs. This includes Wild Rare Utah, Project Wild, uh, and the Seeds of Conservation. These offer hands-on experiences in conducting activities and implementing environmental education programs. This is our seventh year doing the IC program, and between 2016 and 2021, our team has delivered 3,220 classroom programs for 70,536 students. Another important aspect of our education department's work is the huge variety of camps and classes offered at the zoo, at the zoo virtually and offsite. I think that when most people think about camps and classes, they think about summer camps and programs directed at kids. And our team does a lot of that with summer camps for kids ranging from topics on uh, keeper camp to magizoology. They don't just happen in summer. We also do fall and spring break camps and classes throughout the year. These in-person camper, camps, campers learn about the diverse animals that live at the zoo and have a chance to meet a variety of species and form long lasting connections with the wild world. We also offer classes for all ages, all year long. This includes fun themed holiday classes, such as our 18 plus Valentine's Woo at the Zoo game show style class, all about animal mating and courtship rituals. We also offer evening paint night classes, scout, ba scout badge collection nights, and so much more. And with so many things and all of these camps and classes going virtual in 2020, it presented quite a few challenges, but also a lot of opportunities, including expanding our reach. And while we are incredibly excited to get back into the classrooms and to have students join us back on ground, we will continue to implement the valuable lessons learned from this virtual crash course. That is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for letting me gush about outreach at the zoo. Thank you to our many partners. I'm sure I've missed some on this slide, but they are what enables us to do any of our work and push forward towards our mission of creating champions for wildlife. Yay, thank you, Tori. I mean, you are so enthusiastic about your educational programming. It's wonderful. It's very inspiring. Oh, thank you. Um, we did have a couple of questions. We have a couple of minutes left. So we were curious, um, obviously zoos were hit hard during the pandemic. How much did you rely on virtual outreach during that time? And to what extent are you still using virtual events for education today? Uh, we relied on it a lot. Our education team got really good with a video camera. Um, they developed tours of areas of the zoo, which was really cool because they were often in areas that we weren't able to take guests to on a regular basis. So they did tours of our animal hospital and our giraffe barn. So it presented a lot of really cool opportunities in that way. Uh, and another cool thing about that is that we were able to save and bank all of those types of tours so that we can make them available in the future. I think they're still evaluating the balance between virtual and in-person events. Um, but I'm sure it's something that we will continue to do. 
Yeah, love the behind the scenes <laughs> programming you can do. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but um, thinking about the pandemic and ensuring accessibility, um, how, how are, sorry, um, how will these strategies be modified or maintained as time progresses to increase the importance of equitable and inclusive practices um, with your programming? I, I think that's largely still to be determined. Um, you know, so many of our projects are fortunate that they are outside and that is a reasonably safe environment. Um, and those sorts of things will absolutely continue. And we've been fortunate to be able to do things like sending people home with a USB to photo sort, and we will certainly continue that. But with so many things, it's kind of a playing it by ear at this point. Totally. Um, so you manage a lot of different volunteers for all of these projects. Do you have any tips on coordinating volunteers? Oh, it was a portion of my job that I was really not expecting to be so involved with, and it is very challenging. Um, I think communicating early and often with volunteers is really important. So things like as soon as we get our dates set, it goes out to all of our past volunteers. We have email lists that we maintain to maintain contact with them. Um, I think finding diverse ways to engage them is really important. Um, I think it's, I have a harder time getting people to come back and do the same thing over and over again. So when we can provide a diversity of opportunities, I think that helps us maintain volunteers through time. Um, and just open communication with them so they really feel and recognize how much we value their work and that it is going towards something very meaningful. Yeah, I mean, if people don't feel valued, why would they show yep. back up? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just, I think, looking at the Jordan River and these other um, conservation and education projects, what are you doing to sustain these programs into the future? Um, well, it's very much built into my full time status here at the zoo that that is a big portion of my work. Um, through some of the grant funding that we've gotten, we've been able to invest in tools and things that will last for a long time and that will also avail make us able to kind of not necessarily decouple but work independently of the Jordan River Commission as well, so that we aren't entirely reliant on the um, for our, all of our supplies. Um, but getting staff buy-in was really big to ensure that the program is accepted by our entire staff. And that sort of buy-in keeps the institutional investment going, I think, in a big way. Totally, right. And and then the community buys in. Yeah. I mean, as seen by your pictures, obviously mm -hmm. people cared enough and wanted their backyard to be clean. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you so much, Tori. If anyone has additional questions, be sure to email Maureen or us and we will get them to Tori. We certainly appreciate your time here today and um, continue going on. We look forward to seeing what the Hogel Zoo comes up with next. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.